Matthew chapter 6 today. Sixth chapter of Matthew is where you can turn in your own copy of Scripture. Hopefully there should be a pew Bible somewhere within reach. If you want to open up to Matthew 6 and that, you're more than welcome to. We'll have it on the screen, but we always encourage you to open up Scripture with us. Uh, if you don't have a copy of Scripture in a translation that you can read and understand, you're encouraged to take one of those pew Bibles home with you to, uh, today as a gift from our church. We're actually excited that we ran out of Bibles in the back. We had to order a brand new case to stock up, which means people are saying yes to that invitation and taking Scripture home with them, which we think is absolutely awesome. So we'll be in Matthew chapter 6 in just a few moments. Two years ago, when our family was on sabbatical in the summer and took our whirlwind 23-day, 14-state, nine-national park road trip across the western United States, one of the last spots that we went to was actually the globally most well-known, and that's the Grand Canyon in Arizona. I think we have a quintessential family pick there. Yep. That's what you have to do when you're at the Grand Canyon. Take that specific picture uh, on the south rim. I do have to tell a funny story. We got to this point, to the largest, widest picture of the Grand Canyon, and one of our girls, who will remain nameless, said, eh, I'm not impressed. I thought it'd be bigger. <laughs> so yeah, good luck for whoever they marry. Um, <laughs> the Grand Canyon, as, as a national park, is 2,000 square miles. It's massive. It's got over 136 different hiking trails that will take you all over the park, all across the desert landscape, up and down, even down into the canyon, to the different layers of the plant and animal life, all the way down, if you want to, to the very bottom, to the Colorado River. There is so much to see. I mean, you just look at that picture. So much to explore. We were there for less than 24 hours. Of the 136 trails we could have hiked down, we did part of two trails. That was it. We got to see some really beautiful sights, some big wide-angle pictures, but we didn't get to explore near the depth that the park had to offer. And that's kind of how I feel this morning as we come to the grand subject of prayer in our series. You see, back in October, we started walking through what it means for us to have a living relationship with the living God, how you cultivate a genuine friendship with Christ. Yeah, we know Jesus is with us everywhere we go, but how do we lean into that reality every day, that he's not just everywhere, but he's with us in every moment of every day, to have a living relationship with the living God. And when you're talking about living life with Jesus, I think we can all agree prayer is absolutely essential to that. In fact, it's a natural outgrowth of two of the things we've already talked about so far, which is spending undistracted time alone with God and hearing God's voice through his word. Prayer naturally leads us to the next thing you know, in both of those situations. And yet prayer is overwhelmingly deep, guys. There's so much that we could and should say about it. We're only going to not even scratch the surface of the subject in one message today. In fact, there is honestly one element of prayer that I really, really wanted us to dive into today, and we just don't have the time to do it, which is why I'm excited that we have this new podcast that we're doing. So tomorrow we're going to kind of expand on that. So be listening for that on Wednesday and Thursday because there's a very important and neglected element of prayer that we're going to talk about in that episode. So again, that's coming on Wednesday or Thursday. So when we're talking about, about prayer, we're standing on the edge of the canyon and there's so much that we're not going to see. But what I pray that we are able to see, and this is the short time that we have before we come to the Lord's table, is enough for us to have our appetite stirred so that when we step out of this place in a few moments, that you have an intention set in your heart that you're going to spend time talking to your Heavenly Father this week in prayer. So let's go ahead and hear what Jesus has to say about that in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 5. Jesus says, And when you pray... You must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, 
they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil brothers and sisters this is the word of god Amen. let's go to the lord in prayer together gracious and loving god we thank you that it's by the blood of Jesus that we can come to you and we can approach your throne as a throne of grace and mercy. That because you have adopted us as sons and daughters, all those who place their faith in Jesus can come to you as our Heavenly Father who loves us, who loves to hear the prayers of his children. And so, Father, as we take time today to try to, to lean into this subject that has so much depth, there's so much that we're not going to cover today, Lord. Would you, in the heart of each person, just highlight the one or two things that they need to hear? There's, a, there's going to be so much that we talk about. Would you just please, Lord, in each heart in this room, draw each person closer to you in, in the way that they need, in the way that they're going to know it's you, their Heavenly Father, drawing them. Father, by your Spirit, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts that seek Jesus above all things. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so just like standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon, there are so many elements of the passage that we just read that we could explore. In fact, it was a few years back, we actually spent a couple months walking line by line through the Lord's Prayer and what it means for us to pray in this way. There's so much, again, that we're not going to get to today. In fact, there was one subject I really wanted to cover this morning that we're not even going to be able to touch, which is why I'm really excited about our podcast that we have that's going to be up probably by Wednesday or Thursday because we're going to dive into the element of prayer that we didn't get to talk to, talk about this morning. So be looking for that. But with the time that we have this morning before we come to the Lord's table in just a few moments, my prayer is that we would be able to see the role that prayer played in the life of Jesus and, and still in Jesus, what he's doing right now, the, the role of prayer in the early church, maybe some of our struggles for why prayer is so hard for many of us, and then just give two very simple practical steps that we can take to grow in our life of prayer. Whether you've never had a life of prayer consistently with God or you've been praying consistently for decades, that we would all be able to grow in this area this morning. Now, before we get into that, to that I want us to, to think about a question, a question that kind of rises up from this passage that we may have never really considered before. And the question is this, why do we pray? Like, what's our motivation behind us coming to God in prayer? It's kind of subtle, but that's one of the first things Jesus addresses in the passage we just read in Matthew chapter 6, the motive of the heart in prayer. In verse 5, Jesus says, When you pray, you must not be like the, the hypocrites, for they love to pray and stand in the synagogues and at the street corners. Why? that they may be seen by others. 
That was the motive of their heart for the, the praise and applause of man. There wasn't anything wrong with praying on the street corner or praying in the synagogue. Jesus himself would do the very same thing. But the motivation in their heart for why they were coming to God in prayer was skewed. They weren't coming to God for God. They were coming to God for praise of man. So again, I ask you, why do we come to God in prayer? Do we come to God in prayer simply because we want him to give us things that we want? Now, asking God for things isn't a bad thing at all. In fact, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11, Jesus is going to tell his disciples to ask, to seek, and to knock. If you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father who give good gifts to those who ask of him? No, God delights to give us good things, but again, is that our only motivation when we come to God? To ask him to give us things that we want. Do we, sometimes are we guilty of treating God as this kind of benevolent Santa Claus in the sky to whom we give our wish list to and then go out with throughout our day without a second thought? Is that what prayer is? Just God, give me these things. And if that's truly what our motivation is, we have to ask ourselves, is that what a living relationship with God looks like? Is that what what a cultivated friendship with Jesus is? Now, again, there's nothing wrong with asking God for things. Again, Jesus tells us to do that. But notice how in this passage, in verse 8, Jesus says that, that your heavenly Father already knows what you need before you ask him, and yet then goes on and says, this is how you should pray. The fact that Jesus does that, Jesus is teaching us that prayer is not primarily about getting things that we want or need. Now, I I remember very early on in my faith reading this passage where it says that your heavenly Father already knows what you need before you ask him, and then we're thinking in my mind, then why pray? If God knows what I need before I ask him. And the more I've thought about that, it's more of an indictment on how self-centered my faith was. Well, listen, if God already knows what I need, why do I have to talk to him? It's like a child saying of their parent, well, my parents know what I need. Why do I need to speak to them? Is Is that all our relationship with God is? Of just you give me what I want? We all have that friend, right? That friend that only comes and talks to us when they need something? How how healthy and life-giving is that relationship? Think about that in marriage. If you only spoke to your spouse when you wanted something from them. If that's the the dynamics of our relationship, that's not a very healthy marriage. So why pray? What's our motivation in prayer? What's it supposed to be about? You and I were made for a living relationship with God. And prayer is one of the essential, foundational ways that we build and cultivate and connect in our relationship with our Creator, with our Heavenly Father. Tim Keller, in his book on prayer, puts it this way. We must not see prayer as merely a way to get things from God, but as a way to get more of God Himself Prayer is a striving to take hold of God, Isaiah 64. The way in ancient times people took hold of the cloak of a great man as they appealed to him. Or the way in modern times we embrace someone to show love. In other words, prayer, rightly pursued, is about knowing and loving Jesus. The things we get from God out of prayer, those are great. But primarily, it's to know and to love Jesus. To cultivate that that rich communication with our Father. Again, the way a healthy friendship or a healthy marriage is built on rich communication and time together. This is what we see modeled by Jesus himself throughout the Gospels. In the life and ministry of Jesus, you see it completely saturated in prayer. Jesus taught his disciples to pray. He cleansed the temple for prayer. He insisted that certain spirits couldn't be cast out except by prayer. 
more than just something Jesus taught, prayer was something that Jesus lived. We've already talked about the fact that Jesus would pull away and spend that undistracted time alone with God in prayer. Sometimes all night, sometimes through tears. Christ was transfigured into divine glory before three of his disciples while he was praying. When Jesus faced some of his greatest challenges in his earthly ministry, he faced those through prayer. Jesus prayed for his disciples, he prayed for the church, and he prayed for you in John chapter 17. With the cross before him, Jesus prayed in agony and sorrow in the garden of Gethsemane. Jesus died on the cross praying. And as if that wasn't enough, three days later, Christ rose from the grave. He ascended to the right hand of God the Father Almighty where he is right now. And what is he doing for you right now according to Romans 8 and Hebrews? He's praying for you. (laughs) He is interceding for you according to the perfect will of God. Jesus' life and ministry then and now is centered around prayer. Immediately after the ascension of Jesus, the book of Acts tells us the early church was constant in prayer. When the church gathered, they devoted themselves to prayer, so much so that the office of deacon was actually established so that the apostles could have more time to pray and focus on ministry of the word. Leaders were selected and anointed and sent out in prayer, And Paul taught the early church to continue steadfastly in prayer, Colossians 4.2, to pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5.16, and to pray in every situation, Philippians 4.6. So from just the life and ministry of Jesus and the example of the early church, we didn't even touch the Old Testament, guys. From just Jesus and the church, overwhelmingly you see in Scripture that prayer is not this optional accessory that maybe if we have time to, we should think about getting into, but something that's absolutely essential, crucial, and non-negotiable for what it means for us to know God, to love and follow Jesus, and to live all of life with Christ. In fact, Martin Luther, the great reformer, went so far as to say this, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. That's how crucial prayer is. I think that many of us in the room today can recognize, even just in principle, that prayer is important. And yet I will get behind every single one of you in the room who would raise their hands and say, we struggle with prayer, don't we? We do, for all kinds of reasons. Some of us struggle with prayer Because we have asked God for things in life. Good things, right things. Things that from our perspective made absolute sense. And then when they didn't come to fruition, when they fell through, we struggled with that. What we would call unanswered prayer. Some of us struggle with just this feeling of dryness and lifelessness in prayer. We come to God in prayer and we feel nothing, we sense nothing, we are overwhelmed by what feels like the absence or unreality of God. That our prayers do nothing but bounce around the the ceiling of an empty room like we're talking to ourselves. Some of us, we struggle simply just to stay focused. Uh, If we're praying in the morning, some of us struggle to stay awake when when we're praying. We struggle to pray with other people. We struggle to pray by ourselves. We struggle to pray for ourselves. We struggle in all kinds of ways to engage in what Scripture says is this essential life-giving activity. And so if you come into this room today and and we're opening Scripture and we're talking about prayer and you're like, oh, gosh, I struggle with prayer. This is something I'm not good at. I really, I really stink at this, actually. Then you're in good company. Because that struggle you feel, that, that tension, that wrestling, is actually a normal part of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus and what it means to, to follow Christ. If you're struggling with prayer today, welcome to the club. You're in good company. And yet at the very same time, 
We shouldn't be discouraged, nor should we let the fact that most of us struggle with prayer kind of be an excuse to throw up our hands and say, well, say, we all, we all struggle with it, so we don't need to try. We don't need to press in. We need to grow in this area. No. Think about the most important and life-giving relationships that we experience, like, like marriage and like parenting. Those are two of the most life-giving and yet most challenging and difficult relationships we walk in in life, being a parent and being a spouse. They have challenges and hardships, and yet they have rich joy that comes with it. In the same way, Tim Keller writes, I know of nothing that is great that is also easy. I have know of nothing that is great that is also easy. Therefore, prayer must be one of the hardest things in the world. Because prayer is great. It's awesome. It's wonderful, and it's worth us growing into. Okay, so how do we do it? Like, how do we actually do this? And again, I'm, I'm, I'm praying that no matter whether you're sitting here thinking this morning, I have never really prayed before. Like, I maybe pray before meals or, or pray when things get really, really bad, but actually having a disciplined, regular prayer life with the Lord, that, that's not where I'm at. I've never been there. Or maybe some of you, I've prayed regularly for, for decades upon decades. I pray that there would be things that all of us could glean from this. But let's start with like the foothills of prayer for a moment. So how do you begin this life of prayer? First, you have to set your intention to pray. You have to set an intention to pray. Notice what Jesus says in verse 6 of our passage this morning. When you pray, go into your room and shut the door. When you pray, go into your room and shut the door. The scenario that Jesus is describing in that moment is not this, oh, I happen to walk into a room and all of a sudden the door behind me slams and I find myself magically in this moment where I'm by myself with the Lord and now I pray accidentally. No, it's a very intentional. You go and you set the time and you set the place and you go and pursue this time with the Lord. You intentionally plan to pray, to get alone, undistracted with God, and communicate with your heavenly Father. It doesn't happen by accident. It happens by intention. John Piper gives really just sound advice when he says, one of the reasons so many believers don't have a significant prayer life is not so much that we don't want to, but that we don't plan to. Nothing has been thought out, no time, no place, no focus. We should all know that the opposite of such a plan is rarely a wonderful flow of deep, spontaneous experiences in prayer, but rather a rut. You just keep doing the same thing over and over again. If you want renewal in your prayer life, you must plan to see it. Again, this is true in just regular relationships, is it not? I mean, I'll go ahead and throw myself under the bus and say that as a husband, I am horrible at setting aside those times to just take Rachel out on a date. Like to have that time to go away and to do our own thing, just, just the two of us. But I love when we get to do it. I enjoy it. I really do. And I always have the intention to do it more often than we do. But you know what I don't do is plan. I don't actually pick up the phone and call my mother-in-law and say, hey, can you come in from Hutto and watch our kids? I don't actually get on the internet and try to find the fun thing for us to go do. I have the intention, I have the desire, but that intention and desire never becomes action, planning, and preparation, okay? In the very same way, we can all say, you know, I really would like to have a better prayer life. I really would like to connect with God in this way. I really want to grow in this area. But if we put no intention, no planning, no preparation into this. Again, Jesus is saying, go into your room and shut the door. And when he's saying that, he's not saying the only place you should pray is in your room with your door shut. No, he's saying there's intention, there's, there's action, there's preparation. You're, you're setting aside this time and this place to meet with God. Whether it's in your room by yourself, whether it's in your truck before you go to work, whether it's the 15 minutes that the kids are down for a nap, wherever it is, you're setting a time and a place, an intention to seek God in prayer. This is what it means for us to be intentional about this time with God. So maybe that's the first step for you. Set a time and intention to meet God in prayer. The second thing 
I'll give us this morning is pray in response to God's word. Pray in response to what God has said to us. Now, before we get into this, I want to preface by saying this. Guys, you can, by God's grace, you can just get alone with the Lord and you can just talk to him. Like you can. You can just pour out your heart to God. You can just tell him whatever is heavy on your heart. You can just just pour it out to him without any kind of formula, without any kind of roadmap, you can just talk to the Lord. It's a wonderful thing that we have a God who condescends to us in this way that we can just come and pour our hearts out to him. So you can do that. And I don't want anything that I'm about to say to be misconstrued to say, no, this is how you have to pray. This is what you must do. I'm not saying that. But I do think it's interesting to note that In Luke chapter 11, verse 1, 12 guys who had spent their entire lives up to that point praying go to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, teach us to pray. Or in our passage this morning that Jesus says, when you pray, don't just heap up empty words like the pagans do or or thoughtless repetitions like the Gentiles. Pray then like this. In other words, both of these passages tell us that we can and we should grow in our prayer life. We should grow deeper in our communion and connection with God through prayer. Just like in any healthy relationship, you can grow deeper in communication from just shallow, superficial conversations to really deep things of the heart. And so when you go and you spend that time with God, one of the ways that we can grow deeper in our prayer life is by praying the scriptures. By praying the scriptures, or to say it another way, speaking to God in response to what God has said to us in his word. Speaking to God in response to what God has said to us in his word. That's how a conversation usually goes, right? Like if you're sitting down with your best friend and and he begins to talk about, you know, challenges he's facing at work or things going on in the home. He's like, yeah, I'm really dealing with this. And the next thing you say is, you watched the football game last night? Or let me tell you about, you know, this issue over here. And you're not even responding to what that person has said to you. It's like you're not really tracking with what, how a conversation goes. Well, God's word is God speaking to us. And so when we we have God's word before us, it's a good and right natural thing to respond to what God has said to us in his word. This is actually what Jesus is doing in what we know as the Lord's Prayer. Like if you go back, and we don't have time to look into it in detail, so I put it in your bulletins for you to look up in your own time. Every line of the Lord's Prayer is based off of what God has said already in Scripture. Jesus is responding, connecting to the truth of God's word in the Old Testament, every single line. And so when we want to grow deeper in our prayer life, it's a good idea to pray in accordance with Scripture, responding to what God has said. Eugene Peterson says it this way, the reason why our prayer life can so often feel stale or flat, and I think many of us who've who've tried to pray as a discipline know what that's like, stale, flat, lifeless, The reason why our prayer life can feel that way is because we've uprooted our prayer from the soil of God's word. We're not responding to what God has said to us in Scripture. And yet when we root our lives in Scripture and we pray in response to what God has said to us, all of a sudden we find ourselves in a conversation with the living God. We may wonder, okay, that sounds really great, but what does that actually look like? Like, how do we do that practically? Okay, so let's just say, hypothetically, tomorrow morning you get up, and whatever time of day works for you, you get alone with Scripture, and let's say you just happen to to read the very passage that we read this morning in Matthew chapter 6 about prayer, and you get to that verse where Jesus is talking about the hypocrites that pray on the street corners in order to be seen by others. And then as you read that, the Holy Spirit kind of brings that, that weight upon your heart. And you're like, yeah, I do that. Yeah, sometimes I do the right things for the wrong reasons. Sometimes I, you know, 
I, I post things on Facebook so people think how great I am at this or, or I bring this up in a conversation. I do things so that other people will think well of me and, and praise me, not for God, but for my, myself. And the reason I can rattle that off is because that's what I struggle with so often. And so maybe you see that in Scripture and the Holy Spirit gives you that conviction and then you turn that into your prayer to God. You say, yeah, Lord, you're, you're right. I, I, I'm, I'm guilty of this. I sometimes do things for, for other people instead of you. Will you please forgive me? And will you help me to, to do things for the right reasons and not for others? And that's it. Like in that moment, do you see how you've taken what God had just said to you in his word and then you've turned it into a response to God in prayer? You're having a conversation with the Lord through, through Scripture. Don Whitney in his book called Praying the Bible says it this way, when enlivened by reflecting on Scripture, prayer really becomes more like a real conversation with a real person, which, exact, which is exactly what prayer is. God speaks to us in his word, and we speak to him in response to what he has said. You're praying the scriptures. You're, you're, you're communing with God through his word. I'll be honest. This was a, a, an approach to prayer in scripture that I wasn't taught until about seven years ago. And it totally rejuvenated and renewed my time with the Lord because it's some, we talk about praying and reading the Bible, but sometimes we, we separate those things too, too drastically where you, you read the Bible and then you pray instead of prayer and Scripture being united together as one, a conversation, a time of communing with the living God through what He has said to you. Has anybody struggled to stay focused when they pray? Does anyone struggle to like, especially when it's early in the morning, to even be able to, to keep track of a conversation with God? When you pray through Scripture, you are letting God keep you on track. You are letting God direct the conversation by being rooted and grounded in His Word. By the way, another thing that I didn't include in here, but I wanted to throw out, if you struggle to stay focused in your prayer life, like if you start having a conversation with God and then all of a sudden start thinking about this, start going in this direction, and, and then all of a sudden you're not even praying, you're like making a grocery list. One of the great ways that I have found that helps me is I, I just write my prayers out. So I, I have a journal. Well, this is not a new like thing. You're, oh, yeah, this is, this is not radical. This is very common stuff. But if that helps you as it helps me, maybe try writing out your prayers. That helps you stay focused and stay on track. And especially when you have a copy of God's Word here and your journal there and you're taking what He said here and you're responding to it over here, you find yourself just having a conversation with the Lord based off of His Word. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this, that when we use Scripture in prayer, we're praying according to the Word of God. And on the basis of his promises, we take our stand on the solid ground of God's revealed word. But the last thing I want to say this morning before we come to the Lord's table is this. That when it comes to the subject of prayer, when Jesus says in Matthew 6, verse 6, that we get to go and we get to spend time with our heavenly Father. That we get to go and call God. Our Father, God, the creator of the universe, who is infinitely holy, and you and I who are infinitely unworthy. The fact that we get to come to God and have a conversation with him. This is the very heart of the gospel message. Amen. It's what you read in Romans chapter 5 and in, uh, and in Galatians chapter 4, that we, even though we were, were dead in sin and enemies of God, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we could be adopted as his sons and daughters and that God would send his spirit into our hearts so that we cry out to him as our Abba, as our Father. And more than anything, I, I would like you to know that if you believe and trust in Christ, if you have said yes to Jesus in that way, you are a son or daughter of God and your heavenly Father delights to hear from you delights to have that conversation with you, for you to cast your anxiety and frustrations upon him because he cares for you, and he desires for your relationship to grow to new depths, to new levels of intimacy and love than what you maybe have previously walked into, grow in your communication with him.
because he, you were made for a relationship with God to cultivate that friendship with Christ. And, and the final thing would be just the word we heard earlier in Romans chapter 8, that incredible promise that even when we don't know what to pray or how to pray, we can know the Spirit himself is interceding within us with wordless groans for God's will in our life. And so whatever it looks like for you this week, would you, would you set the intention to get alone with God, undistracted, away from the noise of the world, of the world, to get alone with God and his word and to talk with the God who loves you, with Jesus who saves you as the Spirit himself intercedes for you. Let's do that this week. Let's pray together.